Hello, boys and girls. Welcome to Story Hour. My name is Carol Gooden, and I'm the media specialist at Windmill Point Elementary. Today, our stories are all about animals. The first one is called, Will We Miss Them? Endangered Species by Alexandra Wright. This book is about some amazing animals that are disappearing from the earth. Some are becoming scarce because hunters kill them for their horns, tusks, skins, or fur. Others are vanishing because they cannot compete with people for space, water, or food. Will we miss these animals? Can we save them? The first step is to learn who they are. Will we miss the bald eagle? The bald eagle is not really bald. It is called bald because from a distance you can't see the white feathers on its head. Bald eagles build huge nests, eight or nine feet wide. When there are no big old trees in peaceful, quiet places, bald eagles have no place to build their nests. Once, bald eagles lived in every state except Hawaii, but now they are thriving only in the state of Alaska and in parts of Canada where there are lots of big trees. These bald eagles are searching for their dinner. Bald eagles have better eyesight than almost all other creatures. They can spot small animals moving in a field a mile away. Will we miss the African elephant? African elephants are the largest creatures on land. Their babies weigh more than grown-up people do. The elephant's tusk trunk is really an upper lip and nose. The muscles on the top of the trunk are very strong and can be used for pushing. The underside is much more delicate. You will never see an elephant striking a blow with its trunk because that would hurt. The trunk is not used as a drinking straw either. The elephant takes water up into its trunk and then squirts it into its mouth. Elephants are endangered because of two problems, hunters and farmers. As more people try to farm the land, there is less space for the elephants. Also, hunters kill elephants for their valuable ivory tusks. You can help protect elephants by refusing to buy anything made of ivory. Will we miss the blue whale? The blue whale is the largest living creature on our planet. It can weigh more than 30 elephants. A newborn blue whale calf weighs 2,000 pounds and gains 200 pounds a day every day for the first year. If you gained weight at that rate, at your first birthday, you'd weigh almost 300 pounds. People once thought that whales were fish because whales live in the water. But whales are mammals that must breathe air through a blowhole, which is like a nostril on the top of a whale's head. For many years, people hunted whales for their meat and for their blubber, which was used to make oil for lamps and other things. Now that we have electricity for light and know how to pump oil from oil wells, there's no reason to kill whales. Will we miss the panda? The panda lives only in a few small areas of China, in places where plenty of bamboo grows. Pandas will eat small rodents and several kinds of plants, but their favorite food is bamboo. This panda may eat up to 40 pounds of bamboo each day. For hours, it happily chomps on bamboo shoots. Bamboo splinters don't bother the panda because its throat has a lining that protects it from splinters. In this picture, the pandas look cute and cuddly, but they're actually quite big 
and have coarse fur. A full-grown panda may weigh 165 pounds or more. Pandas have been hunted and have been unable to survive when the bamboo forests died or were cut down. China has passed laws to protect the panda, and pandas are now a worldwide symbol of conservation. Will we miss the Galapagos tortoise? The Galapagos tortoise lives only on the Galapagos Islands. When the first people arrived, there were so many tortoises that the people could not have walked across the islands without walking on tortoises. Unfortunately, when these explorers landed, rats left their ships. These rats ate the tortoise eggs. The people made tortoise soup. Today, few tortoises are left. When a baby tortoise does grow up, it really grows up. The one in this picture weighs 600 pounds. Galapagos tortoises live longer than any other animal on Earth. If nothing harms this tortoise, it may live to be 200 years old. No one knows what it means, but these tortoises make a bellowing sound like a trumpet blast. A bellowing tortoise is so loud that you can hear it over a mile away. Will we miss the mountain lion? The North American mountain lion is also called the puma, cougar, and panther. People used to fear these big cats and hunted them whenever they were near. East of the Mississippi River, few mountain lions are left except for the Florida panther. The Florida panther is one of the most secretive animals. This big cat sometimes spends its days in trees and usually hunts at night. The cougar of Arizona and New Mexico is the largest unspotted cat in North and South America. It is over eight feet long from the tip of its tail to its nose and weighs over 200 pounds. This huge cat can jump as high as a second story window. Wow, what a great jumper. Will we miss the whooping crane? As winter approaches, the whooping crane flies south to the salt marshes of the Texas Gulf Coast. Its 2,000 mile journey from Canada is full of dangers. It must avoid hungry wolves and coyotes, hunter's guns, power lines, and strong winds. The whooping crane nearly became extinct. In 1941, only 21 of these large white cranes were still alive. Then laws were passed to ban all shooting of whooping cranes and to protect their nesting grounds. These laws have helped to save the bird from extinction. By 1990, people counted 150 whooping cranes, including full-grown birds and their cinnamon-colored babies. Will we miss a grizzly bear? Grizzlies like to live in places that make good farms, like open meadows and river valleys. This means that they often compete with people for space and food. Grizzlies eat almost anything, berries, leaves, small animals, fish, or even roots. Grizzlies who live on the West Coast enjoy feasting on salmon in the summer. In winter, a grizzly finds a cave or a hollow log to use as a den for a long winter sleep. Kitten-sized cubs are born in the winter and are already bigger than a basketball when they leave the den with their mother in the spring. In the United States, except for Alaska, few grizzlies remain. The best place to see one is in the national parks where they are protected. Will we miss the manatee? Manatees are air-breathing mammals that are related to elephants. Even though manatees are huge, they're playful and peaceful animals. They swim by moving their tails up and down 
and using their flippers to steer. In shallow water, manatees can walk on their flippers. Sometimes they even use their flippers to hug each other. Manatees live in the warm waters of southern rivers. When they come to the surface to breathe, they are in danger. They are too slow to swim out of the way of motor boats. Many are killed when boats hit them. Others make the mistake of trying to live in the warm streams that come from power plants. If the power plants break down, the manatees catch cold and die unless they find another source of warm water. Will we miss the muriqui? Like a trained acrobat, a muriqui swings through the trees using its tail, hands, and feet. Its tail is prehensile, which means it is used for grasping just like a fifth hand. A muriqui can swing up by its tail or even hang upside down by it. The gap between these trees is too big for the baby muriqui to cross, so its mother is making a body bridge between the branches. Muriquis hardly ever come down out of the trees. They live only in the southeastern forest along the coast of Brazil. This area, unfortunately, is also where most of the people live. As the forests are cut down, the muriquis are disappearing. Out of the thousands that used to live in Brazil, only a few hundred are left. There are all so many people who care about the survival of the muriquis that this monkey is a symbol of conservation in Brazil, just as the panda is in China. Will we miss the rhinoceros? The name rhinoceros may sound kind of funny, but it means nose horn. The horn on the rhino's nose grows and grows as much as three inches a year. The rhinoceros is the only animal that has a horn growing from its nose. Other animals have horns growing from the tops or sides of their heads. A mother rhinoceros uses her horn to protect her baby from lions, hyenas, and crocodiles. There are five kinds of rhinos. Some have only one horn, others have two. But all rhinos have very poor eyesight and must drink water often. That makes them easy to hunt. It is against the law to kill rhinos, but hunters still kill them for their horns, which are very valuable. There are now very few rhinos left, and most of them live in protected reserves. Will we miss the mountain gorilla? The mountain gorilla is the largest living primate. This gentle, shy creature is the only ape that likes to spend most of its time on the ground instead of in the trees. It eats seeds, fruit, nettles, wild celery, thistles, and other plants. With an opposable thumb like humans have, these apes can pick up the smallest seeds. Only a few hundred mountain gorillas are still alive. They live in a few small areas of Central Africa where they are studied and protected. You might see a lowland gorilla in a zoo, but a mountain gorilla can only live if it is free. A group of mountain gorillas is led by a large silver-backed male. He protects the group and leads it through the forest. Newborn babies weigh about four and a half pounds. Their mothers and aunts feed and carry them and shelter them in a nest of branches at night. Just like people, their babies can't walk until they're about one year old. Will we miss the crocodile? The big toothy mouth of a crocodile is really amazing. It has about 100 sharp teeth. When one tooth falls out, a new one grows in very quickly, and new ones can grow in again 
45 times. Even with all these teeth, this mother crocodile can be very gentle. After she makes a nest and lays her eggs, she watches carefully until the eggs hatch. Then she opens her mouth so her babies can climb in to get a ride down to the river. The babies never finish growing up. They grow bigger every year of their lives. Imagine if people did that. Some crocodiles are endangered because they are hunted for their valuable skins and because they are dangerous neighbors. A crocodile lying in the sun to get warm can surprise you. Watch out. If disturbed, it can run as fast as a racehorse for a short distance. Will we miss them? Yes, we probably will. Each animal is part of a pattern that is woven into everyone's life. But we don't have to miss them. We still have time to save these endangered animals. We can save them because, like the whooping crane, they're beautiful. We can save them because, like the grizzly bear, they are an important part of our heritage. We can save them for the most important reason of all. They are all part of the amazing balance of nature that makes life so wonderful. Protection of wildlife is very important now because so many species are endangered. Millions of wild animals are killed every year to supply people with fur coats, souvenirs, and exotic pets. Special habitats, such as salt marshes, are destroyed by pollution. Rainforests are cut down for their wood and to make more space for farms, homes, and industry. To help endangered species, learn everything you can about them and tell other people about them. Visit the zoo and your local library to find out about wild animals in your area. No matter where you live, you can do something. If we all care, we can make our world a place where people and animals can live together in harmony. I hope you enjoyed Will We Miss Them? Endangered Species by Alexandra Wright. Jane Yolen has written a beautiful book about the tropical rainforest. It is called Welcome to the Greenhouse. The illustrations are by Laura Regan. Welcome to the greenhouse. Welcome to the hothouse. Welcome to the land of the warm, wet days. There are no doors in the greenhouse, yet strong lianas bar the way. There are no windows in the greenhouse, yet ropey vines frame the views. There are no wooden floors in the greenhouse, only fallen leaves and white rootlets and fungal threads. There are no walls in the greenhouse, only the giant forest trees. There is no roof in the greenhouse, only the canopy of leaves where the sun and rain poke through narrow slots, where the slow green-coated sloth and the quick-fingered capuchin make their slow, quick ways from room to room in the greenhouse in the dark green, light green, emerald green, bright green, copper green, blue green, ever new green house. But it is not all green in the hot green house. A flash of blue hummingbird, a splash of golden toad, a lunge of walking lizards, a plunge of silver fish, a slide of coral snake through leaves, a glide of butterflies through air, past crimson flowers, past showy orchid bowers, everywhere color threads through, spreads through the hot green house. And this is not quite a quiet house, not in the day. With the ahoo, 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 
of the howler troop welcoming the dawn with the crinch crunch of longhorn beetles chewing through wood with the pick buzz hum buzz of a thousand thousand bees droning over flowers with the high chitter chitter of the golden lion tamarind warning off intruders with the creak 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 of keel-billed toucans feeding on ripe sweet figs with a sniff 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 beneath the fig tree where the wild pig picks through the fallen fruit this is not a quiet house not even in the night with a chirrup chirrup of chorusing frogs from limbs and logs from trunks and leaves from the water's edge from the rocky ledge welcoming the dark with a quack 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 of the boat billed herons fishing in the river with the whoop whoop whoosh of the fluttering bat flying through the evening air with the twittery twitteries of the kinkajous calling from the tops of trees alert for the soft growl of the ocelot on the prowl for its next meal this is a loud house a bright house a day house a night house a wet house a warm house a single and a swarm house, a monkey house, a tree house, a fish and bird and bee house. Welcome to the greenhouse and the hot summer days. Welcome to the greenhouse by Jane Yolen, illustrated by Laura Regan. Jan Brett is one of my favorite authors and illustrators, and she has a new book called The First Dog. Long, long ago, in the great days of the Pleistocene, Kip the cave boy bounded down the trail on his way home. He avoided the aurochs, the cave bears, and the megaxeros. He evaded the woolly rhinoceros, the wild horse, and the mighty mammoth. But he was getting tired and hungry, and he was still a long way from home. He marched on until he saw a great rock. It was a good place to stop and rest. Kip reached in his bag for a woolly rhino rib, still sweet and smoky from his fire. Suddenly, up popped a paleo wolf looking for leftovers. Wolf's nose began to twitch and sniff. He sniffed to the left and he sniffed to the right. What are you doing, teased Kip. What can you smell in this emptiness? Paleo Wolf held his snout high in the air. With his keen nose, he could smell a rain cloud across the valley, the track of a tiny toad, the pelt of a prying pachyderm, but most of all, he could smell roasted woolly rhino bones, and he gave a hungry whine. Pooh, said Kip, I can't smell anything but my dinner, and it is all for me. And he turned his back on Wolf. But Paleo Wolf had already hurried away, and when Kip saw the reason why, he was just able to get away in time. Soon Kip was back on the homeward trail. He walked on and on until he spied a cave. It was a fine place to stop and rest. He thought about another rhino rib, still crackly and crunchy from the fire. Up popped Paleo Wolf, looking for leftovers. Wolf's ears began to turn and dip. He listened to the left and he listened to the right. What are you doing? mocked Kip, taking a big bite. What can you hear in this silence? Wolf cocked his head. With his fine canine ears, he could hear a fish rise in the river, 
a leaf fall, the soft pant, pant, pant of a cave bear. But most of all, he could hear the snap of woolly rhino bones still crisp from the fire, and he gave a pleading howl. Pooh, said Kip, I can't hear anything except my teeth crunching on these very tasty bones. And he threw a clump of moss at Paleo Wolf. But Paleo Wolf had already hurried away, and when Kip saw the reason why, he was just able to get away in time. Soon Kip was back in the, on the homeward trail, more footsore and weary than ever. He trudged on and on until he saw a big tree. It was just the place to stop and rest. He climbed the tree and reached for a woolly rhino rib, still pearly and greasy from the fire. Up popped Paleo Wolf looking for leftovers. Wolf's eyes began to sparkle and dance. He looked to the left and he looked to the right. What are you doing, jeered Kip. What can you see in this darkness? Wolf's eyes glowed. With his sharp eyes, he could see the shimmer of a distant drop of dew, a mouse scurrying far away, a feline sleeping high above. But most of all, he could see a pearly, greasy morsel of rhino bone shining in the moonlight and he licked his chops. Pooh, said Kip, I can't see anything except, of course, my roasted, toasted, crispy, crunchy, pearly, greasy, woolly rhino rib. And you won't be tasting that because I want it all to myself. Then Kip yelled, shoo, as loud as he could. The yell resounded up and down the tree it woke every living thing around. Instantly, Paleo Wolf's nose wrinkled and his ears went back. His eyes narrowed and his tail stood out. He looked so terrible that Kip threw the whole bag of rhino ribs down from the tree. Help yourself, Wolfie. But Paleo Wolf did not care about dinner now. His mane bristled and ridged down his back. A long growl shook from his throat. It was his last warning. Kip opened his eyes very wide. He looked all around, but he couldn't smell or hear or see anything. He whispered, What do you know, wise wolf? But Paleo Wolf was gone. There is great danger here, thought Kip. I must disappear too. And he shrank into the leafy branches and made himself very small. Just in time, for high in the tree was the most fearsome of creatures, the saber-toothed cat. She crouched, she snarled, and then she sprang. She hurtled past Kip, hidden in the leaves, and pounced on the pile of woolly rhino bones down below. All that night, as he sat in the tree, Kip thought and thought. He shivered over Paleo Wolf's last warning. It had not been one second too soon. The next morning, Kip climbed down. There was Paleo Wolf looking for leftovers. Together, they looked at the spot where the bones had been, and they were very gloomy. Finally, Kip made a speech. He said, Wolfie, if you will use your keen nose and your fine ears and your sharp eyes to keep me from being eaten up, I promise to share with you all the woolly rhino ribs and even mammoth meat that I cook over my fire. Paleo Wolf barked meaning yes, and then he wagged his tail, the very first wolf to do so. When Kip saw that, he cried, and I will call you dog, which means one who wags his tail. Then Kip, the cave boy, and the first dog went home. That was 
the first dog, written and illustrated by Jan Brett. The Little Fish in a Big Pond, illustrated by Teresa O'Brien. Once in a big pond, a tiny fish hatched from an egg. He and his many brothers and sisters scurried about together. Life in the pond was hard. Frogs gobbled up the best food. From nowhere, terrifying creatures appeared and snatched up the tiny fish's companions. But he learned to keep out of harm's way. I'm a very smart fish, he decided. I am a fish with brains. The little fish was often frightened by larger fish racing up and down. Sometimes he listened to them bragging. I swam up the creek as far as the bridge in one minute. That's nothing. I've been to the end of the world where the water falls over the edge. Time passed. The tiny fish grew into a little fish. He began to wonder more and more about the world beyond the pond. I'm not only a fish with brains, he thought. I have imagination, too. It is time to make plans. In the spring, the melting snows swelled the mountain stream. The pond overflowed. The little fish boldly took his chance. The raging torrent swept him down the creek. The water rushed over the rickety, wooden bridge and on to the roaring waterfall. The edge of the world, the little fish gasped. I'll never see my pond again. Dizzily, the little fish tumbled over the waterfall and into the frothing water below. For the first time, he glimpsed the clouds and the sky high above. Beyond the waterfall, the stream ran wild and fast. As he rode the roller coaster rapids, the little fish felt that his gills would burst. The stream joined the wide river, flowing on and on until it poured into a great lake. At last, a home fit for me, gasped the little fish. My pond was not so big after all. The little fish learned many things in the great lake. During spring, food was easy to find. As he grew stronger, he learned to jump through the skin at the top of the water to catch small insects. At night, he would jump just to see the stars and the moon. He wondered if he might be able to visit them one day. But the lake was not free of danger. There were fish and strange monsters of awesome size. Whenever the little fish thought he had seen the largest creature in the universe, another would appear that was twice as big. So the little fish searched high and low for a hiding place until at the bottom of the lake he found a tin can and there he hid whenever danger threatened. Sometimes food was scarce in the lake. At other times the water turned an evil yellow color and stank. On hot summer evenings, it was almost impossible to breathe. The little fish hardly ever saw any fish as small as himself. Those that he met would not talk and did not stay. He was so lonely, he would have welcomed the company of a frog. I wish my pond was not so far away, he sighed. What use are brains, imagination, and plans if you don't have a friend? But he knew he would never be able to return, and he pressed himself as snugly as he could into his tin can. I'll never leave my tin can, no matter what, the little fish sighed. The little fish might have stayed forever if it hadn't been for the shiny hook, the shiny hook that struck the tin can and lifted it out of the water. Look, a boy cried, it's a miracle, I caught a fish in a can. We'll take him home and cook him for dinner, his mother said. Leave him in the can, your dad will never believe it. The boy placed the tin can in the back of their pickup truck and they drove off down a dusty road. The little fish stuck out his head and watched as the truck drove away 
on the great lake. It followed the wide river and the swift stream. It sped past the roller coaster rapids and the roaring waterfall. As the tin can rocked, the water splashed out, drop by drop. This is the end, the little fish sighed. I'm going to die. Just then, the truck began to cross a rickety wooden bridge. It's my pond, the little fish cried. My dear pond I left behind so long ago. His heart swelled and he felt a yearning deeper than the great lake. With a splash of his tail, the little fish jumped out of the tin can over the bridge and into the pond. I must find another tin can, the little fish thought, diving to the bottom. But as he looked around, everything had changed. My pond has grown smaller, he thought, and all the creatures have grown smaller too. I don't need a tin can to hide in anymore. This pond is a good place to live. It is just the right size for me. The pond creatures listened open-mouthed to the fish's stories about the waterfall, the stream, the rapids, the great lake, and the universe. They trembled when he told them about monsters, men with nets and boys with hooks. From now on, the creatures shared the pond equally. The larger fish were careful and the frogs were polite. The wise fish was their chief. Set your sights high, but don't get out of your depth. Give your imagination room, but be satisfied with who you are and what you have, like me, a big fish in a small pond. Now what are you all gaping at? Then the old fish would curl up in a bathtub which someone had thoughtfully thrown into the pond and dream about the sky and the stars and the moon. The Little Fish in a Big Pond by Teresa O'Brien. Mr. McMouse by Leo Leone. Whenever Timothy saw himself in the mirror, he felt happy. What a good-looking city mouse I am, he thought. But one day, instead of himself, Timothy saw a strange creature dressed in black staring at him from the mirror. He jumped back. He let out a shriek and ran for his life. Timothy ran out of the building that had been his home from the day he was born, and he kept running all the way to the outskirts of town. Only when he came to the country road did Timothy dare to slow down and think things over. What had happened? Where could he go? He knew that he couldn't go back home. No one would recognize him in his new guise. He had no choice. He had to go on, but first he needed a quiet place to rest. It was not long before he found a charming spot where tall weeds grew among colorful rounded pebbles. As he was catching his breath, he heard a noise. Some field mice were observing him from behind the large boulders. They looked frightened. Timothy was frightened too. How could he possibly explain that he was nothing but an ordinary, innocent city mouse. Suddenly, the weeds parted, and a little field mouse stepped boldly forward. Hello, she said. I'm Spinny. What's your name? I am. I am, mumbled Timothy, confused. The field mice stared at him. Spinny smiled. Never mind, she said. I'll give you a name. Mr. McMouse. Timothy was surprised. 
How did you know I was a mouse? Who else but a mouse would have a tail like yours? said Spinny. Then as the other mice went about their business, Spinny pointed to a beautiful mound of boulders. We live over there in the castle. Come with me. Perhaps you can stay with us, she said. Timothy, who felt that he had found a friend, was happy to follow her. As they went, Spinny explained all the things he should know and do if he chose to live in the castle. If you want to stay for good, she warned, you will have to get a field mouse license. And for that, you'll have to pass some tests. But don't worry, I'll arrange everything. The very next day, the tests began. And the first one was the tickleberry test. You see, field mice don't eat cheese, Spinny told Timothy. Only nuts, berries, and grain. But that will be easy. Tickleberries are delicious. When the field mice had assembled on the test grounds, Spinny led Timothy to the berry heap. She then climbed high into the lookout tree to watch the show. But alas! The test didn't last long. After a few berries, Timothy gave up. I'm sorry, he said. I just can't eat berries. They make me sick. Next, Timothy was supposed to run to the heather field and back. But he got only as far as the field, where Bonyback the turtle found him lying in the heather, hopelessly out of breath. There is Mr. McMouse, said Bony Back. He was lucky to find a cab. Everyone laughed except Timothy. He knew that without a license he would have to leave. Now there was one more test left, the tree climbing test. Cheer up, Mr. McMouse, said Spinny. I'm sure you can pass this one. Timothy got off to a good start, but when he was halfway up the trunk, Spinny saw a black cat slowly nearing the tree, its muscles taut, ready for a leap. C-A-T, she yelled as loud as she could. In less than a second, all the mice had disappeared. Only Timothy and Spinny were still running, the cat a few feet behind. Just as the cat was about to pounce on them, Timothy saw an old rusty trap lying half hidden in the weeds. Inside, he shouted, pulling Spinny with him. The cat slid to a sudden halt. What now? said Spinny in a desperate little voice. You'll see, said Timothy, pulling Spinny as close to the back wall as he could. The cat hesitated, yawned, and lay down right in front of the trap. Timothy smiled mysteriously. Don't worry, he whispered. Then he looked the cat straight in the eye, and with the softest voice he could muster, he sang this lullaby. Close your eyes and call your sheep. Count them as they run and leap. One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven. All these sheep will go to heaven, go to sleep. It's getting late. Dreams will bring you number eight. By now the cat was peacefully snoring away. This is our moment, Spinny, Timothy whispered. They tiptoed out of the trap and off they ran. On license day, groups of chatty mice gathered in Castle Square. When finally the head mouse called Spinny and Timothy to the speaker's stand, there was thundering applause, for by now every mouse in the castle knew their story. And when the head mouse handed Timothy an honorary field mouse license and Spinny a special medal for bravery, Happier mice had never been seen. Mr. McMouse, 
by Leo Leone. Old Noah's Elephants, an Israeli folktale adapted and illustrated by Warren Ludwig. So there you are, said Noah's wife, Emzara, as she hurried outside. Noah, I think you should come and see what your elephants are doing. What now, Noah sighed. It was hard enough just keeping the ark in one piece. Between feeding the animals and soothing ruffled feathers, Noah's family was busy all the time. There was always something that needed attention. Just look at those two, Emzara said. Last night when everyone was sleeping, they wandered in here and found the food supplies. If you don't do something, they'll eat everything in sight, she warned. You tell them we already have two pigs. Don't worry, dear wife, Noah said. I'll take care of it. All right, Mr. and Mrs. Elephant, Noah said. Please go back to your room. You must wait until feeding time like all the other animals. The elephant just smiled and kept eating. I said, it's time to go back to your room now. But the elephant still wouldn't move. Enough of this nonsense, Noah said as he pushed on them with all of his might. Yet the harder he pushed, the faster they ate. And the faster they ate, the fatter they became. Noah soon grew tired and sat down to think. After a while, he noticed something strange was happening. Oh, my, Noah cried. Those elephants are so fat, the ark is tipping over. Noah began praying. What should I do, God? We'll all perish if I can't get the elephants to move. Tickle the hyena, replied the Lord. What? Noah asked, quite surprised. Tickle the hyena, the Lord said again. Trust me. So who was Noah to argue? He found a goose feather and tickled a hyena on the nose. The hyena screamed with laughter and nearly rolled on top of the lion's tail. Roar, growled the lion. All of the noise made a giraffe jump. His head bumped a monkey asleep on the rafters. The monkey fell onto a zebra's back. The zebra kicked and kicked. Splash! Over went a barrel full of fish. A moose stepped on one of the slippery wet fish and slid across the floor, thud right into a hippo. The hippo sat down and almost flattened two chickens and a peacock. Squawk! Yap, 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 barked a dog, and it began to chase the chickens. When the dog ran by, it scared a cat, who leaped over a rhino and surprised a mouse. The mouse hurried into a basket of vegetables and hid under a big green cabbage. Suddenly, the big green cabbage disappeared. Squeak! The elephants were terrified. They dropped what they were eating and ran off to opposite ends of the ark. We're saved, Noah cheered. We're saved. That evening, Noah and his family thanked God for answering Noah's prayer. They held a big celebration that lasted long into the night. Have you seen the termites today? Emzara asked. I can't find them anywhere. Noah's eyes were closing. We look for them tomorrow, he said, and he kissed his wife good night. Old Noah's Elephants, an Israeli folktale adapted and illustrated by Warren Ludwig. Mousekin Finds a Friend, story and pictures by Edna Miller. The day song had ended. All the voices that fill a forest by day had said good night. 
Mousekin felt lonely as he waited for the peeper's call and for the night song to begin. Only when the mist had hidden every leaf and sheltered every nest did the peeper call from its hiding place, whip. Far off another answered, sleep. Then, as if by magic, the night was filled with sound. Clicks and whistles, hoots and howls, echoed back and forth in the forest. Mouse King sang one note, as sweet as any bird, but no one answered his call. Mousekin was about to sing another mouse song when he saw a figure, much like his own, scurry along the branch above him. He raced up the branch to meet his new mouse friend, but it hurried away down another. They hopped to the right and darted to the left until the two of them came suddenly face to face. There are many things that can fool a mouse in the forest. There are moths that look like owls and birds that look like mice and a misty night in springtime can make them all seem real. The furry little bird scolded Mousekin for being such a fool, for not knowing a real mouse from a titmouse and for giving her such a fright. Mousekin rap-a-tapped his paw so fast that he made the catkins jump along the branch beneath his feet. He had never been tricked like this before. He knew a cattail couldn't bite, nor a pussy willow chase him. A catfish never caught a mouse, though a real life cat just might. Mousekin stopped his angry tapping when he heard a rustle in the leaves close by. Then he saw a shadow. Was it a mouse's ear? With a squeak of delight, Mousekin chased after the little form as it disappeared into the leaves on the forest floor. He searched all around the foxglove that grew beneath the tree. There was no mouse to be found. Only a foxfinch ruffled its feathers and peered into the night to see what moved below. Mousekin was so eager to find a friend, he almost forgot that a real live fox might be mouse hunting too. When he came to the foot of the dogwood tree where the dogtooth violets grow, he heard a friendly sound. Mousekin leaped and found the nibbling and munching he had heard was not a mouse at all, but a box turtle, shell deep in wild strawberries. Mousekin reached for a berry and nibbled it thoughtfully. The old turtle, wise in his turtle years, looked at Mousekin for a long while before he swallowed and said, I've seen lots of mouse ear by the stream. Mousekin raced to the edge of the water that skipped and splashed as it curved its way into the forest. There he saw hundreds of pretty blue flowers growing all about with leaves as soft and as dainty as a mouse's ear, but there was no other mouse to be seen. Mousekin remembered that Forget-Me-Not and Mouse Ear were just different names for the same little flower. Above him in the darkness, he heard a turtle dove coo. Fool, fool. Mousekin washed his face, brushed his ears, cleaned his whiskers, and pretended not to hear. Another figure sat nearby and cleaned its whiskers too. It washed its face, brushed its ears, then tapped its foot much faster than any fairy drum. Mousekin spun around and just caught sight of a mouse's tail as it disappeared into a hollow log. Once again, he chased after the shadowy form. When Mousekin reached the other end, he stopped and peered around. The little shape with the wiggling tail had vanished again. Could the mouse tail growing near the log have played him such a trick? More lonely than before, Mousekin wandered in and about the long grasses. He never even heard the bullfrog's warning call. Mouse hound, mouse hound. The weasel sprang from its hiding place beside the mossy hollow, but stopped 
in surprise to see not one, but two white-footed mice leap for the nearest tree. They raced to the topmost branches and jumped into an empty nest, pulling fluff and feathers all around them and way up over their heads. In the warmth of the nest, Mousekin found a creature just like himself, a squeak that answered his squeak, a chirp that answered his chirp. The day song would soon begin, and Mousekin's search was over. Mousekin Finds a Friend by Edna Miller. Lost the Sea by Claude Clayton Smith. Once upon a sunny seashore, there lived a gull named Gulliver. Gulliver nested among the rocks below the lighthouse. His nest was made of dried seaweed, stems of grass, and old feathers. It was a very warm and wonderful nest. The lighthouse rose above it like a giant peppermint stick. Sometimes Gulliver hunted shellfish on the beach. He cracked open the hard shells by dropping them on the rocks. But most of the time he followed passing ships, feeding on scraps that fishermen tossed to him. One day as Gulliver was following a tanker, dark clouds appeared on the horizon. The wind grew stronger and the waves crested white. Gulliver was tossed across the sky. The storm swept him inland over valleys and hills. All night long the rain blew cold and sharp, but in the morning the sun returned. Gulliver flew high above the countryside. Instead of the rocky beach, Gulliver saw hills and fields. Instead of blue water, he saw green grass and trees. He could not find the lighthouse anywhere. Gulliver had lost his nest. He had lost the sea. The warm sun dried his feathers, but Gulliver was sad. He soared in wide and lonely circles. Finally, far below, he spotted a village. As he flew closer, he saw a lighthouse. Well, it wasn't really a lighthouse, but it did look like a big peppermint stick and it reminded Gulliver of home. It stood in front of a little store called Tony's Barber Shop. Tony looked out the window and saw Gulliver sitting on top of his barber pole. Gulliver sat there all day. At closing time, Tony threw some pieces of bread out on the sidewalk and Gulliver flew right down to eat. The next thing Gulliver knew, he was caught in a big net. He was frightened at first, but then Tony picked him up and he felt warm and safe. Tony put Gulliver in a cardboard box. It had soft rags on the bottom and holes in the top to let in air. Gulliver settled down for a nice long nap. Next morning, Tony gave the box to the bus driver. The bus traveled for a long time across the valleys and hills. At last it stopped and the driver took the box outside. When the bus driver opened the lid, Gulliver flew up into the bright and sunny sky. There was the rocky beach and there was the blue water and there was the lighthouse, tall and proud above the waves. And in the rocks below, there was Gulliver's nest, snug and warm and waiting. Gulliver had found his home by the sea, the gull that lost the sea. <laughs>